Hi, my name's Therese O'Neill. I am a speaker and business coach. I am delighted this week to be a special guest on Prosper's online prosperity show. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show, where we bring you insights and strategies to help you achieve success and grow your mortgage brokering practice. I'm your host, Prosper Tarawinga, and today I have a very special guest, Therese. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Fantastic. Now, Therese comes with over 25 years of experience in the banking, finance, commercial lending, and mortgage broking industry. And Therese is is an expert in the field of business coaching and mentoring, and she's successfully mentored over 200 fresh faces into the industry and many of her past clients have become award-winning brokers today. You've probably used some of them uh, to get your home loan or your investment loans and it's all been through the work of uh, Therese. So today we just invited her so she could share with us her knowledge and proven frameworks that help mortgage brokers level up their business. I want you to get ready to gain valuable insights and so that you can be able to take your practice to new heights. Now, welcome once again, Therese. Tell us a little bit um, about your journey into the mortgage broking industry and what actually led you to become a business coach and mentor. That is an excellent question, Prosper. So my career started in banking and finance before there was a mortgage broking industry in Australia. So I'm that old. I had my first experience I met a mortgage broking couple when I was living in Cairns in far north Queensland. I thought it sounded too good to be true. And I resigned my position as a mobile lender on the Easter long weekend and begged for a job with them. So, and that, so that was in the, uh, that was in the mid nineties. And for any mortgage brokers that are listening today, um, I got paid $150 flat fee for every loan that I wrote back in the day. There was no trailing commission, so no ongoing trailing commission. And what you got paid was um, a re- it was no um, percentage share of commissions like there is today. Fantastic. So you had to literally earn your keep. Whatever mortgage that you're putting across is what you are taking home and that was it. Correct. So um so a good uh, so it would be a not a typical not an untypical month for me to do 20 or 30 home loan applications. Fantastic. And right? yeah, yeah. So that was my entree into the industry. That was in its early days. And I had access to a panel of four lenders at that time. Today, a mortgage broker would have access to 50 on their lending panel, yes. So very different times. So I did that and then I moved from um, um, Cairns to Townsville, still in far north Queensland. Yeah. That was during the time of um, the T. Marie's War. And so Townsville became our, got inundated with defence personnel. So the culture of the town shifted dramatically. So there was a whole bunch of money invested in the town of Townsville. It had the largest public service workforce outside of Canberra. And those soldiers, so anybody, not just soldiers, but also army, so also navy, Council became a base. So those soldiers were coming back or doing their tour of 12 months and coming back with a cash gift that in today's dollars would probably be equivalent to 100K. Tax-free, glass of payment for going and doing 12 months in Timor, they were spending that money in Townsville. So I ran a broking business there. We went nuts. Um, so it's interesting working in different markets, then moved to Adelaide, where I then had two um, children and so didn't practice as a broker then, but I worked for a national brokerage chain there as their national um, sales manager. So now I'm working with brokers all around Australia in very, very different conditions. And 
historical fact, fun fact for people to know. So eight months pregnant, seven months pregnant with my first son, 9-11. So I had flown from at like seven months pregnant, first pregnancy, flown from Adelaide to Sydney because we had a number of brokers in Sydney. I go and do appointments that day. I getting up the next morning, my husband called me. I'm staying in city apartments and he said, have you seen the news? And that's when I actually watched it all unfold. So that was... Um, so that was not long before I then took maternity leave from the industry and out of interest also took the last ANSET flight ever to leave the ground was a return flight from Sydney to Adelaide was how I got home from that. So I've experienced some amazing things in my career in this industry. Absolutely. I mean... Including including parenting young children and also wanting to have a career. So navigating that landscape as well. Um, and my children are young adults now, but um, they're challenges that brokers today face as well. So that's my um, experience in the career, being broking, being mentoring and coaching brokers for the last 15. Fantastic. That's such a, you know, wealth of knowledge and really um you know deep experience especially um this um escapade that you just mentioned that you had to fly uh, during 9-11 and I can imagine everybody mm. was scared during that time and everything was up in the air so you know while you were concluding your question your answer you did mention that there are a few challenges that mortgage brokers are also facing and you alluded to kids what a what 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 are some of these challenges that these brokers are facing today in especially this competitive market and how do they overcome them? Yeah, so it is a competitive market, and but I don't know that mortgage broking, real estate agents, um, accountants trying to crush into new ground and be a bit more aggressive. Everybody faces the same challenge, which is. How do I, I'm, I'm doing well through efficiencies and that sort of stuff. I'm managing really well the business I've got. Um, so how do I get more business? How So I, I still need to grow my business. So where is that growth going to come from? And at the moment, it's a contractionary market. It's difficult for clients to be able to demonstrate the capacity to afford the loan that they want, let alone that they bought the loan that they probably already have that technically they can no longer afford. So it's a contracted pool of my, contracted pool. And that's and that extends across all of those industries as well. Everybody's impacted by a shrinking market. Real estate agents are, conveyances are. Um, probably family lawyers are up, right? Because divorce has gone up. So they're probably doing okay. But a lot of industries now have changed or contracted. So it's a problem. So what you need to do is actually extend your network, Prosper. That's where the growth is going to come from. Absolutely. And part of your coaching and teaching is... Everyone's got the same problem. Absolutely. And part of your coaching and teaching has to do a lot with personal branding. Can we just maybe touch up on personal branding and leveraging uh, social media and how they are important aspects of growing um, your business and especially how can mortgage brokers effectively use these strategies to stand out from the competition based on what you've mentioned that this is now a um, you know a difficult time for 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 them to to really stand out? Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, look, on whole, so I'm not in a uh, retail and I'm not an influencer and I don't work in the creative digital space. So because I follow brokers and people in financial services, I probably have the dullest feed of anybody that owns a mobile phone. Um, so content is poor across the board. It's not very, um, it's lacking in emotion. It's very safe, which is great. So there's a lot of content that's absolutely inoffensive and is beautifully created. 
and the feed is wonderful. So it's all color coordinated and it all looks amazing. But there's the, the, it's it, it's still no matter what channel, no matter whether it's TikTok or Instagram or you're still old time on Facebook with groups or LinkedIn, it's still a social channel. So unless you're showing me some sort of social, um, I don't think that your any of your social media is going to necessarily touch my heart. If I'm your target, if I'm the one whose attention that you're seeking, are you doing anything to get my attention? And if you don't, then you should be listening to me. Because I'm leaving footprints in the snow. Fantastic. I, I really yeah. love it. And, and that's the reason why we're connected today, because, um, you know, your content is really out there and thought provoking. And um, one thing that maybe a lot of people find is, yes, you're right. You know, they would want to stay on the safer side, um, you know, and this because there's so many different, um, you know, uh, things going on in the, in the marketplace right now all they just really want is to get more clients and to um you know not alienate people around them but you've got a mantra you know and i think it's coming from the taylor swift song haters gonna hate um can you just t touch up a little bit about that and he owes me a con like seriously an arena ticket i think hey <laughs> um <laughs> But it, but it's very true, and I think that's a um, it, that's a huge fear that people have. Um, that if you do too much, or you're too loud, or you're too controversial, or I'm just far too personal, or I put a photo on of my kid, and they go, "What are you doing exploiting your children?" That we're hugely worried, um, or a lot of people are hugely worried that that's going to cause some sort of backlash, and then there'll be an impact. On them but you know what is so first of all if I look like your ex-wife and you're going to hate on me there is nothing that I'm going to be able to do to get yeah, change your irrational mind you it's an emotional connection you see me you see her and you see the fella that she left you for there is nothing that I'm going to be able to do to dissuade you and you won't like me you will look for reasons to lo not like me that's your bias so I think, I actually think I'm a pretty nice person. I'm flawed, absolutely. Um, and I've got, as I said, two young adult children who let me know that all the time. Um, and I'm okay with that. And so, and if people are going to hate on me and then I think like all bad on you because you don't know me. Um, and so therefore your hate doesn't matter. But I, I, could count on one hand. So sort of that hate that I get. Gaslighting's a bit more prevalent. But I I accept that that's um, a cost of being loud in my industry where they like you to tone it down and be a bit more respectful. Fantastic. Now, obviously, you're still talking about your industry um, and, you know, how people can really approach the social media there. Um, I've seen a lot of mortgage brokers or people in the financial sector really saying that I'm going to tell you this, but my information is only for advice only uh, or general purpose only. Then what sort of advice or what sort of strategy then can you give someone to say you can still be within the red tape, but at least have some sort of, um, you know, personality there, because with what you're saying and 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 what the industry expects of them, uh, I'm, I'm not seeing some sort of gel going on there. And maybe that might leave um, a lot of people in the industry confused. It's not what people are searching social media for. They're not there seeking actually professional, personalized, tailored advice. So I wouldn't, even you, what you want to say shouldn't require all of those disclaimers. So that's not necessarily going to get my attention. So, so right at the moment, cost of living is an issue. Yeah, rising inflation is an issue. So those things are going to be an issue for quite some time. What are going, people jumping on a line and what are they searching for? So on TikTok, I think it's the second highest search. So there is there is a, 
like this is TikTok Australia. There is a heap of, there is a huge cohort on TikTok, TikTok that is searching and they're searching for um, a better rate on my home loan. So that's what they're searching for on TikTok. You don't need to then advertise the cheapest rate in the market, that, but what's what people are searching for. So put it on your hashtags, put on your captions, um, but make your video entertaining. Give something away for free and get them following you. And then keep them entertained, yeah, and keep them informed in a way that matters to them. And then when they're ready, they will find you because they like you because you're socially aware. Um, now that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Because you're speaking the language that they're already speaking and already, you know, you know, participating in the conversation they're already having in there. That TikTok generation can go on to chat GPT and find the cheapest freaking rate. <laughs> and so then jump on the website. Absolutely. That generation can do that. So bring something to the table um where they want to keep listening to you fantastic i think that's that's a really good um piece of advice there and part of you know your coaching uh involves building a supportive sort of network and you say that is very crucial for success now what sort of advice do you have for mortgage brokers to find first of all their tribe and actually start creating those meaningful connections within um you know the industry for them to actually be successful well, first of all, get started. And secondly, it's up to you. No one's going to jump out because Glen Ira Council shut down their business networking organisation during COVID and haven't restarted it. Um, so get out and find the next council over and see if they've reactivated theirs. And if not, the next council over. Or Google networking groups in or around me, get out and make a start. And then you'll find, so if you're getting out and, and popping in and seeing one networking group a week, you'll find one or two where you really connect with those people. That's what, so just get out and do it. And also, um, what are you going to do to be exciting, to be memorable? So think about that before you... Um, your templated $999 website that has no image of you whatsoever that's not also not secure. So the first time you send me a follow-up email, I'm going to get my Annie spam telling me not to open it because it hasn't come from a secure network. So think about that in advance too. So what are you doing to stand out and be memorable? And probably it's something where you're playing one layer out. I'm a mortgage broker. I go, oh, shit, I ran into one of those last Tuesday night. So annoying. Going to run the other way. So or same accountant, right? Yeah, great. Unless you're a dolphin trainer at SeaWorld, I don't know, like, what's a really cool, exciting occupation at a networking event. So um, I think to think about being prepared for that. Absolutely. I I've Oscar? I, I believe that because with mortgage brokers, they facilitate dreams. They actually, you know, help people uh, live the life or lifestyles that they um, mm. want in their life. So there's so much to choose from there with how they can uh, introduce themselves. Now, you also um, obviously are coaching people and you've got your broker to broker uh, coaching sort of program. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how, you know, mortgage brokers are actually uh, benefiting at different stages of their career? So I've been coaching um, face-to-face and one-on-one -on -one via Zoom uh, going back to just, just pre-COVID. So broker to broker is really taking that online so it enables more people to be able to get access to experts. So not just myself, but um, Melissa, so one of the co-founders, is a multi-award-winning mortgage broker, sat on um, our industry's peak board for a number of years and has runs a very successful team of brokers nearly 20 years. 
So access to her on running teams, process systems, um, entrepreneur mindset. And then the lovely Kira, who's in her 20s, is our digital and social media manager and coach to brokers so that they understand and can navigate social channels and also understand the content they need to be planning and executing to be able to get the attention of millennials and Gen Zs. Absolutely. And, and how- me, I'm doing I'm doing personality and bold and corporate social responsibility. Oh, fantastic. And yeah. brand personality brand personality and personal branding is is what you get me coaching you on. <laughs> fantastic. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in those classes because it, it you really know how to first of all brand yourself and second of all really stand out in a sea of me to people there. Now you did mention uh, Melissa as part of your team and you mm. alluded to the fact that she's an award winning uh, person. Now with what you have done, you've also won quite a lot of awards and industry awards can actually provide um, maybe significant recognition and uh, credibility. What are some of the reasons that you believe that mortgage brokers should actually enter industry awards? Well, I think all business owners should um, very strongly consider entering awards. Um, our industry, like a number of others, is largely self-nominated. So first of all, you need to get over yourself. Nobody's going to nominate you. You need to nominate yourself. That's just the way it works. So that's the first thing. Secondly, by going through the criteria, so it's not an easy process. There are, it depends on the award, but there is, depending on the award, so there are typically, um, you need to provide evidence of claims around sales and profitability. So let's say that that just needs to be compiled and uploaded. So that needs to be verifiable independently. So that's all fine. In addition to that, most awards will have anywhere from five to 10 questions. And so it's a good opportunity for any business owner to revisit their strategy, revisit their plan, and to ask themselves, in addition to, my, I know my sales and profits are meet the required minimum standard, have I done anything exceptional this year? And do I plan on doing anything exceptional in the next 12 months? Does my business, yeah, really stand up to um, scrutiny? So I think it's a good opportunity to do that and to artic- re-articulate what you've done well, relook at your business vision. Uh, So I think that framework for revisiting your business and benchmarking it against your peers, against last year's winners, against last year's finalists and saying, is my business good enough? So I spoke to one of my clients today. I go, the difference between you and the business that you think is going to win the national award in the next next month is the fact, yeah, that they have invested in this key person and you have not. So once you do that, then you're, you can take them on. So it's a good opportunity to benchmark your because that's where they want to be. And this is where they are now. So it's now them having the balls or the brave to do what now needs to be done if they're serious about getting there. So that's another good thing with industry awards. It does lift your profile. No one reads the fine print. If you made, if you're one of five national finalists, you may as well be the winner. Because out of 18,000 brokers, you're one of five. Who cares if you win or not? And if you've prepared, if you've used chat GPT to prepare your acceptance speech, repurpose it to a post the next day, yeah? Because you put some good emotive thought, yeah? Right. Into whatever it is that you've been acknowledged for. 
And then in writing your submissions, because that needs to be well, like, so you do, you write it down, you bashed all that, you throw it through chat GPT to rewrite it so it's grammatically perfect. And then you can repurpose that for social content. Interesting. So not only are yeah. you putting yourself in, in in the realm of winning or giving yourself an opportunity to win, but you can also use that as a way to really connect with your audience, um, you know, utilizing the, you know, the tools that we now have right now. This is the second time you've mentioned chat GPT, Teresa, and I'm definitely going to maybe ask, you know, some of the other use cases that you reckon mortgage brokers can actually uh, delve into it because so many people are very skeptical and afraid of this tool, but you've mentioned it twice. So it warrants the question, um, you know, how else can mortgage brokers um, utilize this tool so they can literally uh, elevate their branding and their own uh, business. If you're sitting, if you're sitting around, yeah, for now, what's good been a good thirty minutes because you can't get started on what you think you're going to post on your social media this week, or you can't get started replying to that email from that client where the templated one doesn't work, then you would then jump on ChatGPT. Seriously. If you if you're sitting there for thirty minutes, and you haven't done anything. What it, what type of GPT will do is get you started. That's all you need, right? Fantastic. You know, coming from another industry, it's it's really uh, interesting. You can speak into Chat GPT. You go, can you send Harry an email? Um, we spoke on Monday. He wanted to set some coaching. He does, he settles two mil, he wants his son works in the thing, um, he needs referrers, he needs this, he hasn't got any networks, he doesn't use social media except for LinkedIn. So, yeah, send him a response and tell him he can start in September, these are the fees, this is the min minimum tenure. If you're interested, we'll have a 30-minute Zoom. I'll go to your website. I'll go to your LinkedIn. Let you know what I think. Let me know if you want to go ahead. So ChatGPT can do all of that. Look at that. And they would have sent that off and I'd look fabulous. And there'd be no grammar mistakes in there whatsoever. Fantastic. I mean, obviously, with what you've just told me, there's so many use cases that a lot of people can uh, utilize, um, you know, especially in their day to day um, life then, understandable. And you've been, um, you know, teaching people for quite a while uh, in this space. Do you reckon the advent of ChatGPT is going to make things so much simpler for mortgage brokers, because when you started, like you said, technology was at like almost a standstill. You only had access to four, um, you know, lenders, like you mentioned, and now they've got 50 lenders. So, you know, does their communication, um, you know, does chat GPT really streamline their communication with all the, you know, interested stakeholders that need, you know, their their time. The, the brokerages, the brokerages I work through, work with that have embraced Chat GPT for their um for their social media, so for their content planning, for their script writing, for their video production, that are using it to write credit submission papers for complex lending in excess of a million dollars to credit assessors, using Chat GPT to craft their emails. Um, so that by the time they get to the office, they've made three phone calls, ChatGPT has crafted and sent those emails. So they get to the office at 8.30 a.m., inbound mail done. So um, it's saving an, a huge amount of time. But That's what you need to be careful of is ChatGPT is also very boring and very beige. So your prompts need to, you need to get, understand what you need to put into the prompts. Um, you need to appreciate that depending on what chat GPT program you're using, that the content like BARD is current, but um, chat GPT4 is not current. So it's two years old. So you need to be mindful of that. It won't give opinions. So what it actually, so there's still a, I'm very creative, Prosper. I think that's my superpower. So when a broker brokerage goes, I need to expand my network, 
I will give them a very creative way to do that um, based on their strengths and what they're actually capable of doing. Um, so there's still um, a space for creative, but I can use chat GPT for my building blocks, right? So I've got it. We've got a new strategy for a new business that will literally double their business if they just invest in this for six months. No problems. And good um, business where it doesn't, you don't have to exert a lot of effort. In storyboarding the social media story to go with, to accompany this, to actually promote this, um, I'll use ChatGPT for that. Great stuff. Now, yeah. I, now I see why you've been voted. So we want 20 posts a month. Yep. Yeah, that is a really feel-good viral story. Right, so you can connect with the people that you're going to be uh, dealing with in the future and obviously create that because it's it's fun and it's cool and it'll go well on video um and it's playing one layer out so it's a social connection absolutely and it involves kids it ticks all the boxes oh absolutely and this now explains why Therese, you have been recognized as uh fbaa national mentor of the year you are always obviously showcasing that you are above you know the rest and you are ahead of the curve especially when it comes to um you know using technology and you have the experience to back it all up so i think that's like a whole big fireball that uh, a lot of people just need to uh experience there now like i mentioned you've been recognized um you know as the uh, fbaa national mentor award of the year now what else besides you being creative, like you've mentioned, and um, obviously, you know, caring for the needs of your clients really sets your mentoring and coaching approach uh, apart from others in the industry? Yeah, I, the creative. I, so I don't, um, and we all have, we all have, we all have uh, ideal clients, yes. So mine my um, ideal client base, if you work with me that you know you're probably going to be challenged to probably get out there and be challenged to put yourself out. So if that's not your natural state, so some people will will accelerate performance really well if they just go to a routine. So um, refine the process, do the routine, and that's absolutely perfect. Not, that's no problem at all, but you probably wouldn't engage me. So I'm there to add the personality, I think, to the brand. So, and that starts with, so I would do refined process. I look at it from the point of view of humanity. So your, so 50 of your last clients were on average 31 and you're calling them, like, is that the best way people, 31-year-olds have, like, severe anxiety about an incoming phone call from a number that they do not recognise, so you're actually not connecting with them. So so it's the fine-tuning. Nothing wrong with the message, but there's a problem with the delivery. It means you don't understand what matters to them and what they absolutely hate. So every time you're calling them, you're annoying them. Fantastic. So, so it's more that refinement. So, young, you're dealing with high income young professionals. They work hard. They work sixty hours a week. They go to the gym when they get home. They're cooking their dinner at ten o'clock. That's when they've got the time they want to sit down and book a home loan interview because they want to go to auction next weekend. Don't bother me with an it like anything else that's what i want to do so have you made that easy for them to do that without friction other because otherwise you're going to lose that business Man. so my lankin brokers if you're dealing in the um like the gen x that generation so in the lankin community so they want to speak to you so if you're not the first to pick up that call the probs are that you'll lose that opportunity so I've got a business there, so they've got an, an, an eight bank of one three hundred. So you get 
So those you, they don't miss, miss an opportunity of an inbound call, and that's so that so that refinement of process for them, what matters to their their target market, they want to call. They don't leave messages. They don't text. They want to. They'll just keep calling somebody until somebody answers the phone. So it's that sort of refinement that you would work with me for. And then by extension, then I'm going to look at your social media and go, uh, people are going to vomit all over your content, to be honest. Yeah. Women my age don't like being mansplained to. Don't do it. <laughs> all you're doing is putting me off. Fantastic. And unfollow you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And while we're still in the in the realm of people vomiting over content and things of that nature. <laughs> In your experience, what are some of the common pitfalls or mistakes that mortgage brokers are making or should avoid to ensure long-term success in their business? Uh, Yeah, and again, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Prosper, and say it's not just mortgage brokers. So first of all, um, in addition to posting whatever it is that you've got to say, how about before you do that, why don't you pay it forward and support other people's content that they're putting out on their feed? So consider doing that first. It's almost like um, there are some people that are of a religion where they you say grace before you eat your food and you, uh, yeah, out loud give thanks for all of the things that you are grateful for before you satisfy your own thirst. So I think, number one, that's a really big thing. If you want to grow your followers organically and grow them with people that are likely to engage actually with your content, which is going to help you grow your followers, then help them out. So I usually, I try to like 30 posts in my feed, avoiding anything that's sponsored and then commenting on six of those 30. So by a sort of one in five is my sort of kind of rule. And I start with Instagram and then I go to LinkedIn, then I go to Facebook. That's my order. <laughs> Fantastic. So-, so there is so much to be gained from doing that. And do that at least for three months and you watch the difference in your engagement and also in your growth of followers. The second thing is prosper. This is an aside. If you actually do that mindfully, you actually get to listen to what people are talking about, which should inspire you to tailor your content accordingly. Fantastic. And obviously... So you actually learn that's like an extra gift for free. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that. I mean, like you say, um, the more you give to others, the more you also uh, receive its reciprocity wherever you go. um, It it usually works. And I think it was um, Zig Ziglar that mentioned that help enough people get what they want and you will in turn uh, get that which you want. Now, in the interest of obviously giving, I wanted to maybe find out from you, Therese, um, you know, as a leading expert in this industry, what sort of um, trends or maybe changes? I know you've already touched up on chat GPT, but obviously there could be new things that are coming in. And I know you're on the, um, you know, on the leading curve of, um, you know, technology and things that are coming in this industry. What do you sort of foresee, especially for mortgage brokers, say, in the coming years, and how can they adapt and thrive in this dynamic environment? Okay, that's a lot to unpack, Prosper. Um, I think that we there's a couple of things. So a big shift, again, affecting all industries. So it is going to be young millennials and Gen Zs by 2030 are going to outnumber us in the workforce. They're also going to outnumber us as consumers. And they are a very different cat 
So I think that's going to impact all industries. Re a a a yeah, so uh, recruiting them into my team, onboarding them into my team, dealing with them as a client, their honesty and um, what they value. So I think that's a big, big shift. And they're all over tech, mate. Um, and they're also there um, and they see through bullshit. So that's going to be a big challenge for brands and it's going to be a big challenge for mortgage brokers because if all I am seeing is boasting and yelling sales at me, then I will mute you. So uh, so in... The, in the marketing space, prosper. So they're going. There's going to be a big impact there. They want authenticity. They want brands that stand for something. Um, and it's hard to stand for everything all at once, prosper. So at, I choose a couple of causes myself. So one is women supporting women, which means a whole lot of things. So we have a low female representation of qualified brokers in our industry it's less than 30 percent so why is that what would what can we do um part of that is um understanding the way women connect and what women want to see and what they really hate so women supporting women has evolved over the last two years in us delivering events on and having conversation about things that matter um to women in our industry and showcasing women that otherwise never get a voice. That's across all industries. It's certainly across real estate. Um, it's And I think it's a really big thing across a lot of industries is looking at that equality. So that then lends into equality versus equity that goes beyond the male female ratio right but it's anybody in a workforce then you start talking about um so that's a big deal for me women supporting women then goes into women's women's health their mental and physical health so um their conversations that women will actually have out loud men don't um, but men are starting to. So I think having those conversations are all, is also really important. So those, for me, that's what I do. What I have given up is Movember. I did that. I supported that for five years by drawing a moustache on my top lip every single day for the month of November, even if I was going to the Melbourne Cup, because it provoked a conversation. My dad died at 63 when he shouldn't have if he just got his health checked. Instead, he leaves everybody bereft of a heart attack, like taken out three minutes. So I've got that. And also I had postnatal depression with my children. And so and so I have had it and recovered from depression three times in my life. So those things matter to me and I'm happy to have conversations about it. And every time I do, huge impact. I My daughter has endometriosis. I wrote a piece on that in LinkedIn, had 45,000 views. And then I wrote an article for the Marunda Press um, group that basically do the mastheads for all of regional Australia as well as Metro Melbourne. Wow. So stand for something. People will buy from you um, because they like what you stand for. They follow you because of what you stand for and they keep following you because of that. And then one day they may or may not buy from you, but they'll probably advocate for you. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, I, I like your conclusion to this because from what i'm gathering you know there's a lot of people that are just spraying and praying with their marketing or their branding out there and they're not literally staying for anything so if you stand for nothing obviously nobody's going to know like and trust you and as you mm eloquently are putting it across people do business with those they know like and trust not to rest mm. I am really, really grateful for the time that we've spent today. And I really, really would like to thank you for sharing your valuable insights and expertise with us today.
to our listeners, remember to check out Teresa's uh, Broker to Broker uh, program, and um, it will definitely take your business to the next level. Join us next time on the Online Prosperity Show as we continue to bring you inspiring stories, strategies for achieving prosperity in the digital age. Stay tuned and keep reaching for success. Uh, Bye for now.